Hello, I'm Bradley Swart, Associate Professor of Computer Information Systems at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And this video is going to take a look at structures when it comes to C++ programming. So this is our first step up into a, a newer paradigm. This is kind of like the step between functional programming and object-oriented programming. So uh, we have to think into the idea here of an abstract data type. So I have a biology and chemistry background as well as computer science. So I think of the int and the character and the bool and the float and the double as the elements of what a computer, you know, what a computer can do. Because at the core level, that's all a computer can handle. At like the assembly language level, it can only handle moving integers and characters and floats and things like that around and perform arithmetic on it. But of course, there is much more to that. I can go ahead and take two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen, H2O, and turn it into a, a completely different structure, water. And then I can take water and I can build you know, other things from that and make larger and larger systems. And the same thing applies here. I can take these ins and floats and make them into more and more things here. So an abstract data type is something that is that where values can be stored and the operations can be can be performed on those values. So we're going to, in, in the discussion of structures today, we are basically only going to handle the values that can be stored. And then as we move over into true object oriented programming in the next lecture, we will start also worrying about the, the functions, the operations that we can also perform on them. And so what's cool about these kind of data structures is, and you've already experienced it, it's chapter 11 here, is that when you when you implement a you know when you use these abstract data types in in libraries that especially the ones that someone else has created you don't necessarily know how the data is stored like if you use the vector you've used the file you've used uh, what else other things are there that you've kind of used already if you've used those things you just kind of you just used them and everything just kind of worked you didn't have to under, even see out you know just like per, and see in like all those things like you got information from a user you you spat out information to a screen or to a file and you didn't really know i mean you knew what you were doing from code standpoint but you really didn't know how it was truly implemented under the hood so you're already kind of working with that and now it's time for us to kind of take that uh, kind of take it to that next level. So we are, of course, these kind of things are created by programmers, computer engineers and all that create the atoms. And then now we're, we are, as programmers, using those atoms and creating the bigger, the molecules and the, the larger systems. So abstraction is a big deal here. And what that means is a definition of, you know, solving a problem. Like in this case, a triangle. What a triangle is a three-sided polygon. So most likely it's, you know, a, an object of that type or a structure of that type would have three separate entries, one for each of the sides. Maybe it keeps track of angles. I mean, there's a lot, you know, because like there's three angles and three sides to a triangle. And maybe there's a base, like, you know, one half base times height. There's all sorts of attributes that we have to understand. And so I use another example of a skeleton. And so if I were in working in the medical field, I have to understand there's 206 bones to a skeleton. How are they physically related to one another? How are they grouped? What do they do? And like maybe they move around even. And like if I'm making some kind of demonstration, some kind of 3D demonstration, there's a lot more going on with a medical field skeleton versus something that's a video game skeleton that's supposed to just hold a sword to shield and comes running after you and tries to kill you. I don't have, maybe I have a graphic, maybe I have a picture, maybe I have a, a structure, a 3D structure of a skeleton, but I'm not worried about all those nitty gritty details because now I got to worry about attacking and I got to worry about health and all sorts of stupid stuff that a video game has to do. So it all comes down to, you know, what kind of problem am I trying to solve? And essentially I'm trying to sculpt down and, and figure out what is the, you know, the, the smallest version of that that I can create using specific, you know, atomic data types. So let's see here. So using a structure, so you can see here it's about the worst slide ever. And so if I wanted to create a structure class for, or a structure for a circle, this is how it would look. And this IntelliSense fills in for me, struct circle, and then I get curly braces, and then there is a semicolon there. And inside of here, you know, so just to come back here, what if I were to just set up 
a circle. I would have a position in space for the center of the circle, and I would have a radius for the circle. And again, I could have many more little details depending on what I'm trying to accomplish, but I'm just trying to give you, you know, the basics of what some a circle could have. Give me a position in space, give me a, its radius, and I can calculate a lot of other stuff from that. But that would be for one circle object. And what would I do if I wanted multiple of them? Would I copy paste this? I'd have x1, x2, would I have an array of them, an array of doubles, array of doubles, array of doubles for x's, y's, and z's? It gets complicated. And so that's why the structure and the idea of object-oriented programming is so powerful. Because now by moving them into this structure, I give more structure to the data in which I'm trying to maintain. So they're using a student class here, and they have int student ID, string name, short year in school, double GPA. Ours is just double, 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 which is fine, but it's like, like it's, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. And so like in this case, like, well, you're like, what's the difference between all this stuff? Like, I, again, if I want to, I could create a circle. And they don't necessarily show that here. I could say circle C, just like I could say int X. And so I can say, okay, there, x is a type integer, c is of type circle, and so I can say x equals 3, and then like, how would I set things up? And again, we've already done this a few times over, especially with files, and a few, maybe a few other little things where you're using the dot operator. Because now I can say, okay, c is my object, or my structure, and I can say dot, and then I can say, well, which attribute do I want to play with? And I can say x, and I can just say equals 2 or 2.0 if you want to make it double here. And then I can say x dot y equals 3.0. I don't know. And then x c dot radius equals 4.0. And so I can set up those individual attributes because at the end of the day, c is of type circle. But once I hit that, once I put that dot, now I'm, I'm delving deeper into this thing. And by saying c dot x, you can see it here. I almost can. There it goes, circle, colon, colon, x. You can see that attribute, that field, is of type double. So because I've worked my way down into a double data type, I can use that as, as any other double. As any, you know, so if I had an int, I could use it as any other int, and so forth and so on. And so the idea here is like, well, how large is one of these structures? Like, how, how large is an int, right? Let's see. Size of, you can use size of int and put space and then do size of circle circle and then std colon colon and see it dirt and run okay run my program so int is going to be four as we discussed in our case circle is 24 and that's because there's three doubles and each of them are eight bytes of storage so double 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 so another question you could be like well how big is this structure for student and then you go, well, int is four, short is two, double is eight, string. How big is a string, you know? It's a good interview question, I suppose. I know the answer, but do you? What do you, what do you think it might be? It's not going to be what you, it was definitely not what I thought it would be. And the, the, the number that's going to come out doesn't even take into account the size of the string you're trying to maintain. So this is so like it's it's you're gonna see it's it's actually 20 i'll show it to you right now there it goes oops come on there it goes. Ah, come on there it goes 28 bytes and so what is under the hood there's a ton of stuff this this structure this object is maintaining for us and so like i can't i can't figure out how to get 28 bytes of storage for that and that doesn't even include the string itself because notice i'm not even setting up an object i'm just saying what is this what is it of this type and so you, you could you might think here, I hope I can just steal it. I can just steal it. And you're like, well, how big then would be struct student if this is four and this is 28. And I put a CD colon colon in front of it. And then if that's that and this short is short is two and double is eight, you'll go, oh, that must be 1442, right? That's what you say. Screw everything and all that, everything and whatever. Let's see what we get if we say, give me size of student. And the answer comes out 48. And you're like, what did I do wrong? And so there's there's an idea here that the you know the compiler is doing a lot for us automatically and a lot of things that we don't account for. And this is one of them where the compiler is actually padding things out so that when the program runs, because you know nowadays especially it's 2020 middle of 2020 already and beyond that 
we, you know, anything we can sacrifice, we can sacrifice a few bytes of storage. And, and so at least to make things more efficient. So by spreading everything out and putting every, everything on basically double word or word boundaries, when it comes to where to put this information, it makes it easier for the computer to access the data. So that's why it's actually a little larger than what you might expect. And you could go ahead, you could go around and try to shorten this. You can make it maybe a little bit smaller by rearranging these data types. Because, you know, and that's not a discussion for today. But just to understand, though, when you set up structures and you set up classes, that the size of these things are not going to be necessarily what you think they are. So we already discussed a little bit behind how we can access the individual attributes of a circle. And so just to kind of steal their idea here, I can just do a CN. And it, and because everything's uninitialized. I'll show this to you in a second here. And I'll do a C out. Enter X, something like this. Oops, where did my, where did my quotation mark go? Okay, so something like this. Instead of hard coding the numbers in, I can get user input. And so again, coming back to it, that the, as long as I can resolve down to, in this case, C.X down into a double, I can treat it like a double. The computer, the compiler has no, no problem with that. And so let me just show you here. Let me just set up, I'll put a breakpoint here on line 27 and run the program. And I go, okay, I'm <laughs> size of is 48. Yeah, fair enough. And then the C again is uninitialized because it doesn't do any of the initial, initialization up front. So, I mean, even though it's the same value, it's all garbage. So it's on all uninitialized. And only when I go ahead and set up uh, two, three, seven, oops, I don't, have, oh, shoot, now I don't have a breakpoint. And so now I go two, three, seven, and I hit my breakpoint and I mouse over C now and I go, there they are in double format, 2.0003.0007.000. And so again, once, now that I can resolve down to it, C in and C out and all of that is exactly the same. So if I wanted to print everything out and they go, I could just start doing all sorts of crazy stuff here and just say, okay, give me C dot X and then put a comma. And then c dot y, oops, c dot y, then do a closing parentheses, put the word radius and that, and then c dot radius, and then an end line. Something like that, right? Formatting is never pretty, especially when you only have half of you trying to show everybody everything on one screen. Oops, forgot a semicolon. Okay, so then. Formatting, did I do it right the first time? Two, three, seven, and there it goes. There's two, three, radius seven as a printout of what I put in. It's a different representation of the data that's stored under the hood inside of type circle. So I think it's a pretty good, you know, pretty good description of how to access one way or the other, because it's just, I can set it, I can get it like anything else. And so here is a payroll example. This guy loves payroll. It's the same kind of in, same kind of details here. He just uses ints and strings and doubles for things. The user, excuse me, the user inputs the employee number, the name, and the hours of work and the pay rate, four of the five pieces of information. And then the gross pay is calculated right here in line 38 of this thing, is calculated from the previous information given because why should I input that if I already gave you all that information and then it just parrots it back out. So they do things just slightly different. They use formatting and it's a little more complicated of an example, but it gets you to the same place. And so now you've seen this at least two times over. So it's, so you can't just print out C. This is why I kind of wrote everything out the way I did. I, oops, I can't write out C. Just doesn't work. No operand matches these operands. Left hand side is O stream, right hand side is circle. And we'll get into this in chapter 14, somewhere around there. How do we set up this operator? How do we overload that operator? So we could print out a circle in this manner. And this would be the thing I would want it to print, right? Basically, I want to print out the x, y value and then the radius. But again, not going to work out. I have, I, right now I can only break it down and take the, the structure and break it down into its component parts and work from there. But there is, again, there is a way, but not right now. Until chapter 14, we have to sit on our hands and not do it. Um, so you and so you can't the same thing doesn't go if I set up a second circle. I can't test to say if C equals D. Hey sure, Brad. Can't. 
because there's no operator that it's the same idea as the, as this, the printout operator. And so it's the same idea that th there's no way, there's no function that exists right now for the compiler to grab onto to try to compare what two circles mean. What would two circles mean to be equal? You would think it would just test every piece of data against every other piece of data, but obviously that is not necessarily the case. I would have to write the code and I would have to break it down into several if statements if I wanted to check if c.x is equal to d.x and, and c.y is equal to d.y and you know it just gets complicated and so and it might not even be what you want because maybe when we talk about object-oriented programming I have this big record of collection of data and maybe all I want is the you know basically the unique identification number of this object that's sitting inside of it I don't care about all the other details so you just get me object nine and it looks and tries to find it. I don't need to check every detail because even if it was nine, maybe if I had two objects called nine somehow, maybe they have different data under the hood. So it's up to me to define what that means. I can initialize these things. This is what you're gonna see here is different than what you can do in uh, for object-oriented programming for classes. So just watch out for this. This is kind of tricky here where I can go ahead here if I wanted to initialize because I, you know, right here with int x, I could say int x equals three. But how would I do this for a circle? How would I, you know, what would I, what would I do, right? How would I, what is the syntax for something like this? So if I wanted to, and for like I'm, I'm setting up C, but if I wanted to do it for D, I could do something like this. And it doesn't, this does not work for object-oriented programming. This is just for structures. For whatever reason, the syntax is different. And so here you go. It does compile. And now just to show, I can go in there and say, okay, it, it, it all goes in respective order. The 2 goes to the first item, which is the X. The 3 goes to the second, which is the Y. And the 7 goes to the last one, which is the, uh, the radius. So, oops. All right. Let's get there. Okay, so C is still uninitialized but D has all of the stuff already initialized in it. So just, just so you know, and you can't just skip, you, you know, what happens if I skipped? You can't, how would it know? That doesn't work. I mean, it should be, you can't just put nothing between commas. You, you would have to fill it in with something if I wanted to get to all of the data there, if I wanted to get through all of it. So again, it's a little tricky. I can start initializing it and then forget to, and neglect to do the rest. I just get rid of that. And so now it's weird, right? Because the two, the two gets set for D, but now notice it's not uninitialized for the other pieces of data. The other pieces of data have been initialized to zero. And so it gets tricky because the, the difference there, if I just do this, C is uninitialized. Let me run this again, right? This is the fun of nerdy syntax rules. C is uninitialized, but D is all initialized to zero. And that's because the curly braces treat the initialization differently than just leaving it alone. But again, once you've set the thing up, you treat it, you can treat it like anything else. I can't, you know, I, I, I believe you can't actually do this once you've set it up. Let's say, can I? Okay, that works. So I can, I can initialize things. Well, I don't, I don't know, let's find out. C, yep, C is two, three, and radius seven. So yes, you can do things both in the constructor when you can when you're initializing the object and afterwards you could go ahead and change things up i wasn't 100 percent sure in the in the past 10 years ago you couldn't do this so this is part of the changes made in the 2011 upgrade to the c language okay so all these other rules we've already kind of discussed them they did betty ross you know the same kind of stuff betty ross 141 is her employee number she gets paid 1875 an hour and the things they don't put in there are hours and gross pay, and they will be initialized to zero, according to the, my, the understanding of the rules here. For And Jill, the same thing. Her ID number, her hours, her pay rate, I mean, her hours and gross pay will be set to zero to start. I can have array of structures, just like I can have arrays of anything else, in, you know, arrays of integers and so forth. But now you add a whole other la you know, layer of uh, indirection to all of this stuff. So like if I wanted an array of circles, I could go ahead, let me start minimizing this a little bit, bring this down a little bit. I can say, give me 10 circles. And now this is going to break here, of course, because now 
It's too light to get me to any individual value inside of a circle. I have to go two levels in now because I have to go from array to element and then from element, which is a circle. So an array of circles to a circle and then from a circle to one of its attributes. So if, in this case, if like this, I want C0. I have to tell it, like you see here, on here, I have to basically turn it from, turn C, which is an array, into an individual element, and then be able to access its individual uh, field. And so it's all going to be uninitialized, but, so I could, but I can do C0 equals 2, 3, 7, like I was doing earlier. And that'll set up at least element 0 of this circle array, and it'll print 2, 3, 7. And let me put a breakpoint in here. And then, but so you can see here's 10 structures. The first one is the one, zeroth one is the one I tinkered with, but everything else is left uninitialized. And so again, what would have happened if I, I set up 10 and then I put curly braces in here? Now you can see because of that, everything is was uninitialized and then the zero still got blown out by the next line of code, but everything gets initialized to zero values. So it's again, very, Maybe you don't care. Maybe this is the dumbest thing ever for you, but for us working in the field, we have to know these little details. So they have a a structure, an array of worker structures, which is called pay info, hours and pay rate, and they just go through enter, 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 and again using the loop structures, like like just to kind of go through here. Here we can do something like this. For let me just let me make this better here. Const int size equals three. So I kind of like what they're doing. For i equals zero, i is less than three plus plus i. And just print out enter radius. And this is kind of cool here. For circle, I'm just going to do it one. Once you've done it once, you can do it forever, right? So, and then circle i. Oh, I got to put it in here. And then put i, and then put colon, this space, and that, and then std c in. And now I can say enter c ith element dot radius. Enter that. And then now down here I can do when this is all said and done, just to prove that everything worked out, I can give me my radius, and I can say here I can steal this guy. Radius for circle one, and then I can pop it in. And then put the end line in here. Okay, so now you got yourself something. So I can set up three separate radii. Oops, enter radius for circle zero. Humans start counting from one. Maybe I should just add one to this. Little tiny mistake. Oops, I'll need to fix it in both places. I don't want anybody being confused. I plus one, I plus one. And so now here we go. Enter radius for circle one, eight. Enter radius for circle two, two. Enter radius for circle three, nine. And there you go, eight, two, nine. And I can format this if I want to. And I have the breakpoint in here. And as you can see, everything else will be uninitialized because I because I didn't do anything with it. So uninitialized x and y values for everything. But the radii will be correct because that is how I input it. And we displayed it to the screen so we know everything is working like we expect it to. Oh goodness, nested structures. How often do we do this kind of stuff? Not too often. So let's just take a quick little gander here. But it makes sense that you, if I can group things up, you know, like just like a car, it's like, I have a car, right? And a car, <laughs> it has many, many items. A car has a radio, a car has a steering wheel, a car has a this, a car has a that. But when you work down to just thinking of the radio, a car has a radio, a radio has dials, has computer chips, has a CD player, has, has, a CD player has chips, a chip has, you know, this and that. You can work your way down to whatever level of craziness you want. So the real world is like this, we'd have many different structures, many different classes all working together under the hood, work, you know, just kind of working out to make this abstract concept of what a car is. And again, if that's the kind of car versus just a video game car, which is completely different structure. But here for student, I could have name, address, and city as separate fields here, string, 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 but all of that falls under the idea of a, a personal, in, you know, personal information. 
So I can go ahead and create a separate structure that get you gets used by the student. So it's like a we call this and we call this a uh, uh, shoot. Uh, what do they call it? The uh, a has a relationship. I'm, I don't know why the term is drawn a blank for me, but the has a relationship. A student has personal information. And uh, let me find that term. It's a. It's going to be the. It's going to be a duh term once I remember. It. Oh yes, I am thinking of the term aggregation. So it's a class that is a member of another class or a structure that is a member of another structure. We call this a has a relationship. A car has a radio. A radio has a dial. A car, you know, a car has a steering wheel, and so forth and so on. But you can see this—it's the same kind of notation going on under the hood. And we'll see this as we move forward. This is a chapter 14 slide, so no big deal to continue on that. But that's what I was trying to go with here, and that's what this is. It's a anytime you're nesting structures inside structures or classes inside classes, you're dealing with an aggregate object type. So let's see, arrays of structures we're talking through. So we're pretty much good to go, nested structures. Here we go with that. Again, we're not going to necessarily worry ourselves, especially with structures. This will be, an, you know, we can start doing this once we get to more advanced topics. When it comes to a big object or into programming, when we get into, uh, we'll need sort of stuff like this, nested structures, when we get into like linked lists and sets and maps and stuff like that. We will be creating our own nested, we'll be using our own nested structures. Okay, so you can send along a structure as a function argument. So things are a little odd here. Things, you know, things, things are, things are, this is where things change. Pass by value, pass by reference, pass by pointer, all of this kind of stuff. Where I can pass along individual items by value or reference. And so like student.gpa or in our case circle.x, circle.y or something like that. So what I can do here, I can set up a void function and go get circle data. Oh man, I already deleted everything. And so what I can do is I can pass along, or maybe I return. Should I? You know, it's one of those, what should I do here? How about this, just to show things. I'll say, okay, I'm going to take in a circle, I'll call it C, and then, uh, okay, just making sure here, and let me just go ahead, oh well, you're my house, here we go, enter X, enter Y, enter Z for a specific item. And I can say C dot X and enter Y, enter radius. That didn't take that long. And then I can return back. So I'm inputting, 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 oh, dot radius. All right. And so we can use this thing. It's just a function, pass in. Let's just steal this guy here and just say, okay, I have a circle C. And I can say get circle data. And let's see what happens when I hit that, when I hit the breakpoint after. What information is stored inside of C? And uninitialized, uninitialized local variable C used. Wow, that's interesting. I can't, I can't pass that along, but there's a reason why I can't pass that along. I'll just put one, two, and three in here for the moment. Okay, so let's, so one, let's rebuild. There we go. Come on, go away, go away. Go away there. Okay, so when I run this, I say, okay, one, two, and three is my C value, but if I enter five, six, and seven, you know, it's just, oops, I'm already past it already. You can imagine then that I'm entering data here because you can see that I'm doing this kind of stuff. And I return back and I go, my, my C object is still one, two, and three. And so now this is a chapter six thing, right? For advanced, you and advanced programming, it should be you should, be, you should absolutely remember this kind of stuff. Are you still in the first introductory classes? Maybe this is a little more hazy. I'm passing C by value. I'm making a copy of this entire circle object or structure before I pass it along. And so I'm modifying the copy here inside of the function. And then when I get back and I say, what is C? I'm telling you here that it's the copy that I'm displaying or the, the original copy that I'm displaying, and the, the copy copy got destroyed when I closed off, it's no longer needed. So that one little ampersand changes everything. That's what we, you know, that's a whole chapter six issue here. One, two, three is the circle, but once I get to five, six, and seven, now you can see I actually did modify C, because instead of passing along a copy, I passed along the real stuff, and I modified the real stuff, and now that's sitting under the hood here. 
And so for so the, the end, one of the major points here is for things larger than floats and ints and things like that, we need to start passing along references because again, I don't want to pass along copies. When I pass around a reference, I'm passing four bytes of information. I'm passing the memory address of where this wherever this object is in memory. Four bytes of storage. But if I make a copy of it, I'm copying 24 bytes of storage. And this is just a this is a rather tame sized object. You can have hundreds and hundreds of bytes for every object. And then like when we talk about vectors of objects too, like we can have vectors of objects. You can have thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of bytes that get copied along because you forget to pass it as a reference. So we'll cover this again when we get to, con it'll do constant, all this kind of stuff later on. But just to understand here, like I, for this to work like anything else, I need to pass it by whatever, you know, either by value or by, or by reference. But in this case, for larger data, data structures, now reference is the way to go. We don't have to do it for ints and floats because we're already copying four bytes over anyway. You know, int is four, a pointer is four. So there's no way you don't have to go, you know, go crazy on this and go, everything has to be a reference now. It's just things that are larger than the, the you know, the atomic data types that we have to worry about. And so what's interesting, coming back to this here again, if I just say uh, set double, and I just say, okay, a double reference, x comes in, and I just say, okay, x equals 9. And so again, what I can do here, coming back to this line right here, I can do, which is interesting, right? I can just go ahead and say set double, and I can say uh, c dot x. Well, so I'll do c dot y. Not x dot y, c dot and so what that does is, it takes C, finds the Y attribute here, right, which is a double, and it passes it along, but it passes it by reference. And so it's weird, right, because you're two levels in, but I'm still, it's still a double under the hood, and I can still get the memory address of where that thing is stored. And so the actual value of C's Y attribute can be changed by reference. Just like we changed the attributes indirectly or, you know, through here, I passed in the whole thing C and then I went ahead and modified stuff. I can go ahead and just pass the individual attribute, the individual field and change that as well. So just to show here, so it's one, two, three, I can set double. Now C is one, one, nine, three, because the, the Y value has changed. Even though it's X here, I, ch I passed along a reference to the Y attribute which got modified to value nine. And then of course, like before, and so 193, and then this will modify everything again because the function will, you know, whatever I put in, 654. And so now, but after everything else that I've done, C is now 654. Okay, so going with it here, so void show item, this is not good form here, again, to pass inventory item by value, because you're making a giant copy of it, and maybe they should, hopefully they show us here. There we go. Using value parameters for structures can slow down your program, waste space, and all that other stuff. Using a reference parameter will speed up the programming, but the function may change the data, right? There's no guarantee that, that there's nothing saying I have to change the attributes of C when I'm inside of here. But when I don't, when I pass it like this as a just a plain old reference, it's pretty much guaranteed I'm going to be modifying something inside of there. So if I'm not going to, so that I don't have any, if I'm going to, if I were going to, if I did have, if I'm not going to do it, but if I did have a function called print circle, which I should have had earlier, right? And then I pass along the circle, I can, I, it, the rule is I have to pass it by reference to save all that energy and space and time, but I don't want someone touching it and using it, so I pass it by const so that if I try to modify it, I get a compiler error. So I can't, I can't produce a working program that tries to modify a constant circle. So that's, that's a pretty cool idea. So rule of thumb, pass references when you can, const them up if you're passing them in a read-only context. And so that function now is replaced because this is only a show, read print, that I'm going to pass it by reference and I'm going to pass it by const. So I can return a structure. So I can, re I can basically reverse this around and I can overload the function here and I can say get circle data and I can return a circle. And so I can create a circle like anything else, I'll call it C like I have, and then here I can return it. 
And so I can, and again, because I can overload because it has different parameters passed in, I can overload the function name. But, I, but it does exactly the same thing. But this time it's passed by reference, so it modifies it, and this one just returns it back. This one's actually going to be more efficient because this one's going to make a copy and it gets complicated. We can use, you know, move, you can use the new move technologies and stuff like that. But anyway, so I can set up a circle. I can go ahead and call this, but this time I'll say, I'll say C equals. Actually, what I can do just so I don't have to initialize it, I can say something like this. Circle C equals get circle data. And so let's try it out. Or maybe I can't. Oh, <laughs> coming back to this. Yeah, because it's const. Okay, so I'm here. I'm clear. Here we go. And here we go. So I run the program. I wasn't expecting the breakpoints. Of course, I should have been. Oh, come on. There we go. Enter X, 6, 8, and 9. And coming back, circle C here is 6, 8, and 9, like I expect to see. Because this function is returning the circle that gets created inside of here. And you and it's like, watch out if you're going to pass by reference, because you never again you never want to pass a reference or a pointer to a local variable. We've shown that in a previous video. But as long as it's a value type, as long as it's a local variable and you pass it by value type, it'll make a copy of it, return it, and everything will work out just fine. So I said if I accidentally make this a reference accidentally pass it and you go okay XYZ five six seven you go yeah that works out but what happens if I do you say but we've discussed what happens if I go ahead and call any other function and let's see what happens this time around enter circle data I'm gonna enter one two and three you're not gonna see it here but now after I do other stuff, print circle and stuff like that, oh, it does keep the data. But again, the problem is if I'm passing by reference a local variable, and there should be a compiler warning here. Let's see, does it give me the warning? Yep. Returning address of local variable. I just couldn't, I just couldn't trip it up this time. But what's happening is the circle is being passed by reference, which means this one here, the local variable. But when we when the function returns back, that thing is destroyed. So actually, let me, let's go ahead and let me, what, 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 let me set aside here. Let me just set up, hmm, let me set up a different function here. Avoid function x, pass in an int, just real quick here, set up a local variable and just do something like this. And instead of print circle, I'll call x with four. Let me see if I, I just try to, I got to break it. I got to hack it down to prove to you that it's not working right. And so I'll try this again, one, two, three for my data, just to prove there's my one, two, three. And then I go, okay, what is circle now? Oh man, I still can't break it. I still cannot break it. Um, but again, the whole problem is that this is a local variable, a local structure. I'm returning a local structure, which gets destroyed when I hit the closing curly brace because of the scoping rules, but still there's a reference to it getting passed and getting returned. Oh, and oh, I know why it's not working right. It's because when I pass something by reference, as I say, I talk these things through sometimes, and I and I let these out almost half outtakes go through, so you can see, you know, that programming is difficult for all of us, and sometimes little tiny rules kind of get lost in the way, especially with C plus plus. I can return a reference, but if I return the reference to a circle that is not a reference. It basically is the same as returning it by value. It will make a copy of it and put it into C, so I don't have to worry. But maybe now, and if not, I'm going to move on anyway. But now, if I pass it along, because it does give me a warning, right? It did give me a warning that I shouldn't be doing that. But what if I do it anyway now? I'm just trying to blow out the stack. That's all I'm trying to do. And so now, okay, go ahead, get circle data, enter one, two, three. And now, please, there we go, finally. It's all garbage sitting under the hood because by calling that X function, the stack gets all that information that was previously there gets blown out by the new information from this new function. And so it's all garbage. And so even though I got all the data and I returned it back, it's no good. We, this, you cannot do this. So if I, I, have, to, I have to return this by value type. 
And so, and I can, and I can't turn a value type into a reference type, but I can turn a reference type into a value type. And so one last time, just to go one more time through this, now one, two, three, and now C will hold the correct data because value type out and put into a value type. Okay, so that's more detail than they go into here, but you may see this and say, this is part of the reason why you should think of compiler warnings as compiler errors. If you see a warning, and I, you know, like everybody else, sometimes you just want to fly through and get, get through with the project. Yeah, I have... Uh, I have like a nine and a half hour video series for making a game and an engine in C++. At the end of the day, there's six, seven, ten different warnings in there that I never fixed up that I probably should go back and fix. But, but you know, but I, you know, so that's shame on me. But the, the general rule is if you treat a warning like an error, get rid of it because it's trying to tell you that somewhere along the line, something's going to happen and your program is flawed and something, some little tiny little fringe case might occur and things aren't going to work like you expect them to. And it, it usually pops up at the times you least expect it. Uh, I can have pointers to anything. I can have references to circles. I can have pointers to circles. And so I can go ahead, I, once I have circle C set up, I can have circle pointer D equals address of C. Go back to the you know that the previous video if you're understanding for your understanding of pointers. But now again, I have two separate ways of accessing C. I can access C directly through C, or I can access D indirectly through D. And, but I can do the same kind of stuff. C dot x equals 100, right? And then now this is where things get tricky because remember we have to dereference. And so you might think I could just do like this star D dot and like okay dot y equals 98 and notice what happened here it's funny here right like the intellisense is trying to help me out but it made everything worse so just to show here i just did what they're saying here of any structure has an address it's a pointer like i said cer technically cer c is a pointer to the first piece of data anytime you have something even a variable is technically a pointer it's just that we we kind of dereference things automatically. But I got the address of, just like they got address of for this one. And so now, you know, say, look at this cool stuff here, right? <laughs> so to access data, I have to dereference, like I was showing you. But because of the order of operations, I would have had to do something like this. And now the, you know, now the IntelliSense, and now I actually get this thing to compile and work. There we go. And that's to say, okay, take D, which is pointing to where C is, dereference it, go to that memory address, offset over to find the y variable attribute and then set it equal to 98. And so you noticed what happened there, it changed it to the arrow. And that's just the shorthand way because you don't want to have to do this every single time. So that is just the arrow, which is dash uh, greater than symbol, is just a shorthand way of doing parentheses with the star and the dot. Just understand that. And this is for structures and object-oriented programming how to take a pointer to a structure so I can get myself one, you know, get, get to the attribute stored within. And so, but otherwise, a reference and a pointer are, you know, at that point are, are the same kind of deal. You're doing the same kind of stuff because a reference is a memory address, a pointer is a memory address. And at the end of the day, th there are some differences, but we don't necessarily need to worry ourselves with that. And again, we need this pointer idea once we start getting into chapter 15, when we do advanced uh, inheritance and polymorphism and that sort of stuff. Without pointers, we, none of that will work. And so it's unfortunate that this is why we have to go down this path and take all this extra time to learn how to use this stuff, this idea of a pointer. And so the last thing here is the idea of a union. We don't generally use this kind of stuff anymore, so that's why I'm going to fly through it. What is a union? But it's similar to a structure, but all members share a single memory location. And so those of you coming from uh, or have taken or will have taken uh, advanced, uh, not advanced, uh, assembly language, microprocessor assembly language, yep, they're not even going to show it to you. What you can do is set up a union. And let me just see. <laughs> it's been a while since I've called it here. I'll just call it EAX. You know, I'll just call it register. And so Okay, I'm allowed to do that. And so what happens is inside of a register on your CPU, you can have a character 
and I can call it AX, or sorry, AL. I can have a short, I can call that E. Sorry, I'm not thinking and talking too much thinking and talking at the same time. And I can I can call that AX, and I can have a an integer value that is EAX. And I can't necessarily this breaks down. I can't put AH into this because then it wouldn't work out like I wanted to. But the whole the whole idea here is that at the end of the day, this is just this is basically just four bytes of storage, but I can treat it like any of the three types at any time, but it's the same memory address. So if I modify it as AL, I modify it as all. If I modify it as AX, I modify it as all. So what are they saying here? It's similar to a structure, but only one member of the union can be used at a time because it's sharing, it's basically, basically different aliases. Different, you know, an alias is just a way of reference, referencing something. And again, this is just a memory address. It just, it's just sitting there. It just, and how I treat that memory at a given time is all that matters. And it's like, you know, again, if I'm hemming and hawing through this, why do we care about this? Again, we, we generally don't today. This goes back to eras where memory was, you know, very, you know, was very hard to come by. And so like, you know, say we're just laying waste as much as you know, all, all of this feels compact in here, circle there and just go crazy because we have, it feels like infinite amount of memory in our CPR and our RAM. We have infinite amount of memory for our programs. But back when we only had 2K, 4K for entire programs, entire video games, all sorts of everything, I couldn't just do that and say, just for three, you know, for three lines of code, I'm going to use this integer and then just throw it away forever. They go, that's not how it's going to work. So I would, I would have to recycle and share all of these memory addresses in different parts of my program and make sure that I'm, you know, I'm referencing pieces of information that, that I, that I don't need anymore. And so that's where this idea comes from. And so, so again, it's been years since I put the word union into a computer, but it's part of the slide set, so I figured I would talk about it. Rather than, usually when I'm in class, I just kind of just fly right through it and don't even mention it. But I figured since we're here and I'm making a permanent record of all of this, why the heck not? Okay, so the, la the really the last thing here is what we call enumerated data types. So what is that? It's a programmer designed data type and it represents integer constants. So I have already, wherever I had that earlier, I guess I got rid of it, const int size. It's not really meant for things like that or const double pi equals 3.141.9265.35 and so forth and so on. It's more meant for, how would I describe it? How about if I had a deck of cards and I could have an enumeration called uh, ranks and I could set up and say ace is one and then from there I could say two, and then I could say three, and you'll deal with it. I'm gonna type it all out. I've got five, I've got six, I've got seven, I've got eight, I've got nine, I've got 10, I've got jack, I've got queen, I've got king. Not king, I've got king. And so ace could go in one or two places, and if you, I don't even know, I don't think you can, because that would be weird, right? Because then you'd have a duplicate. Ace redefinition, yes. It doesn't, why doesn't it scream at me? I don't know. But that's how the ranks would be set up. And so ace is a one, you can see this by mousing over, and then anything after that is two, three, four, five. If I don't put the equals one here, ace will be zero. So I just want, that's why I put this in. So ace was set up with a value, and then everything else is just incremented from there, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so forth and so on. So. So I can access these as, as constants. There's no way you can change any of this stuff. I can't just go ahead down here. Oh my goodness, I have to go all the way down here and just say ace, because I can access ace. Ace equals two. I can't do that. Must be a modifiable L value. Enumerations cannot be modified. They're all basic constants. But what I can do is use them. And I say, okay, so I can ask the user for, I'll get, oh, let me go to main. I'll do something like this. Enter value, and we know we're in. Yeah, we know what we're asking for here. I'm going to add this value, and I'm going to get it from the user. And then I'm just going to say if my value is equal to ace, then print something. Sure, whatever. Else. 
print something else. Something else. Something else. Okay, so we can try it. And so it's just a constant. Enter value two. Oh come on. There we go. There we go. It, it it said something else because it wasn't the ace value, which is the one. And if I enter one, there's my ace. So it's very simple. It's basically an integer constant that but the, the there's you will see here in a few slides here. There's issues between converting between integer values and enumeration values because this is essentially a uh, it is essentially its own type. And so, if I were doing this for a, a playing card class, I would have ranks and suits, and I have, you know, maybe a little have jokers and all sorts of other stuff. What other things do I need to implement? So here, they have days of the week, Monday through Friday. And so, you know, enumeration day. Notice there's no quotation marks or anything. Monday would be zero, Tuesday one, this is two, three, four, and five in this case. And so we already kind of showed you how to set everything up. And so I can use, this is the data type, ranks. So if I wanted to, down here, because I don't have anything else here, I could just say ranks, because I was just using it as an integer. Ranks uh, ace equals ace. And this is, this is where things get tricky. This works, because I can take an enumeration and turn it into, and it is an enumeration, turn it into enumeration, but I can't say int a equals ace. Is that the one I'm not allowed to do? Or hold on, am I allowed to do that? No, I'm going, whoop. Okay, I'm allowed to go that way. So I can say, I can take ace, which is a one, and I can convert it into an int. But I can't go the other way around. I can't say ranks b equals one. Come on, there we go, finally. A value type of int cannot be used to initialize and turn into a rank. And so that's the big problem here when it comes to this stuff. It just gets a little, everything gets a little iffy here. Oh, uh, and, and there's this whole new thing with uh, strongly enumerated types and stuff like that. Don't mind all the 2019 uh, compiler warnings here just for the just just worry about what I'm discussing here so coming back to all this what's going on here is since this is a rank value it has a value it, it is actually ace is one and so I can convert this ace which is truly a one under the hood to an integer one and it'll work out and I can you know it's an, and convert it to one and put it into an integer but when I say one even though it's staring right at us what if I didn't have anything called one? What if it was just ace equals two and so forth and so on? The, the compiler has no idea what the, the actual thing would be because it's like there is no such thing as one inside of this enumerated data type. So it doesn't allow me to just take a hard-coded number and move it in, at least directly. I would have to use a static cast. And then basically I broke it, turned it into a rank. Take one, and, because there's no such thing as one under the hood here for right now, the way I have it set up. But I'm totally going out of bounds and saying, okay, just throw it in there anyway. Right? Because there's no one here. So anyway, so coming back, Monday is zero, and it works its way up. And you can change things around. Six could be 98 if you wanted to, but then it still counts. Seven is now 99, and so forth and so on. And we just showed... <laughs> but you can have duplicate values, you just can't have duplicate names. Uh, things get weird, right? Like all these little nerdy details. So this, this will compile. 10 is actually 2, Jack is 3, Ace is 2. You just can't have the same name twice. So it's just basically a long list of constants that all kind of share a theme. That's the whole idea here. And say this is just blowing through details here. So you have to watch out for the, like we were saying, you have to watch out for static casts especially for that kind of stuff. If I wanted to loop words, yeah. You have to understand what's going on if Friday is greater than Monday. What does that mean? Like, okay, Friday could be greater than Monday, but Monday could be greater than Friday. It's all based on, you know, everything's a circle, right? So it's all based on, it's all it's all based on relevance here. And so, or, you know, so like ACE. ACE is set up as the, one of the first values. Maybe it's one of the last. Maybe somewhere along the line, people change it. Someone goes ahead and moves it from first to last inside of here and all of my code has to go along with it. But if I do something like this, it could break my code. So this is bad form. Usually you use equal or not equal to, you don't use greater than, you don't use those other relational operators for something like this. So again, this is great for a lot of little things, I, like for a video game. Uh, I think there's an example. There's uh, at least a couple places where I have examples. I can't remember if it was for a student and whatnot, but like for a video game, 
like for a state of a video game, like a tic-tac-toe game. What is the state of my game? The state could be you know, like basically empty, just started. I could have in process, I could have an X winner, an O winner, and a Cats game winner. So there's at least five different states I can think of. That would be great for something like this. I could have just enum tic-tac-toe state. And I could just say game started. I could have the idea of, I guess, playing. I could have cat's game. I could have X winner and O winner. And whatever else I would need. And so I can maintain these and these all have values to them, but now I can use these as constants and they could they could read more, you know, more like human, you know, something that's more like human, right? So if I have tic-tac-toe state. Uh, t equals, uh, what did I call it? Started. And I could say, do something like this. While T does not equal, uh, this is the problem with this, I gotta remember, playing, or, or just, while T does not equal playing and, or sorry, while T is equal to playing or T is equal to started, continue doing stuff, play, whatever it is, play the game. And so now it reads a little more, you know, a little more English as opposed to while t is equal to zero or and or t is equal to one, what do those numbers mean? And so now by doing this and reading it more human, we can kind of understand, comprehend what's going on. And so I can have a function in here that plays the game, at, you know, put something into the, the play field, reevaluate the result now of the game, and maybe somebody won. So like at some point the game went from started to playing. Now cat's game, X winner, Y, L winner, whatever it is, now you're good to go. And so, and then down here you could print out the winner and so forth and so on. Like if uh, if T is equal to cat's game, print something out, right? Something like that. And versus else if, else if, else if. So these things have uses. They definitely do. They're not just there to waste your time. They're there to make your lives a little easier, makes make the programming a little more human readable. I say the Python is more human readable than a lot of other languages. C++ gets down to the very nitty gritty stuff. But that's pretty much all I want to discuss with enumerations. There's a lot more to it. Had a, had a fun interview with the Mortal Kombat people about enumerations and this exact thing about, this is how I remember it so much, this exact detail about ins. <laughs> Did I really remember it? Uh, ints moving into ranks, needing the static cast is something that, one of the little things that didn't get me the job working at Mortal Kombat. At least I got an interview, so I felt uh, felt pleased that I was at least uh, nominated for the job. So there's again, there's a whole lot going on under the hood, especially once they added in this idea of a strongly typed enumeration, and that's why everything is screaming at me. This you know, prefer enum class, and that's what this is showing up over here somewhere. But my hand just fell up here somewhere, wherever it is. That's what's going on there. But if you're interested, go look into it or go look into the Strewster book on how to do it. Um, but things things are good there. And I think we're good to go for the chapter. That is it. For whatever reason, this enumeration thing, it seems to be like half the slides. doesn't feel like it needs to be. But that's about it for the chapter. We've handled structures. Again, the, the major bullet point of everything here is what you see just right here with the struct circle. Structures, generally speaking, only hold data. We don't apply functionality inside of it. That's something we're going to leave for class structure. Not saying we can't, but generally a struct doesn't have that, that extra stuff thrown in. And now in the next video, we're going to discuss the ideas of creating the data just like before, but now we're going to add the idea of functionality on top of it. So again, even though this is an hour, however long this video is, it's a pretty good introduction to what you're going to see in the next video. But of course, we're going to take this and now we're going to apply security features and publics and privates and protecteds and all sorts of other things and get, get features and set features and functions and operator overloads and copy constructors and all sorts of fun crazy things so uh that's coming up in the next video but if you have a question about anything i said here swordb at cod.edu is my email send me a message here on youtube i'll get back to you as soon as i can and uh thanks we'll see you in the next video